Hi, hello, uh, and welcome to this London Climate Action Week event on central banks and climate change, the short and long view. Uh, this event is jointly organized by the LSE Grandson Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment and the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance uh, at SOAS University of London. And uh, I am Ulrich Vaud, the director of the SOAS Center for Sustainable Finance and also a reader in economics at SOAS. And it's my great privilege to moderate this session. Uh, some logistics first. We have 90 minutes today which will be recorded and posted online in due course. Uh, we'll first do a round uh, of introductory remarks by the panelists, and then we'll have a discussion among the panelists, and I would very much like the audience, that is you, um, to send in your questions via the chat function. And I will then try to pick up the questions as best as, as, best as I can and bring them to the panel. Let me now turn to the contents and introduction of the speakers. Uh, central banks are once again playing a very crucial role in the crisis. They have been uh, intervening on an unprecedented scale to avoid, uh, to avoid a full scale uh, financial and economic meltdown. Many central banks have been taking dramatic action that would have been uh, sheer unthinkable just a few months ago. And against this backdrop, we have uh, also seen uh, calls by some on central banks to also throw their full weight behind fighting climate change and supporting just transition. Uh, so many have pointed out that the COVID crisis now uh, is actually uh, uh, paling in comparison to the climate crisis we are facing. Uh, so there are these calls for central banks to also fight that crisis on a much greater scale. Uh, but of course, others have said, no, 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 this is not the role of central banks. Um, we do, of course, all know that central banks um, uh, have been, over the past couple of years, starting uh, to work on climate change, on climate risk, uh, gradually starting to integrate that into their frameworks. Uh, and yet we have seen very few examples during the current crisis uh, where central banks have incorporated sustainability factors into their crisis response measures. So this is basically uh, the backdrop against which uh, we will now discuss how central banks can fulfill their mandates for macro financial stability and align their COVID response measures with the Paris Agreement and avoid lock-in uh, to a high carbon recovery. But we're also looking beyond the short term, current crisis, and we want to discuss broader trends and changes uh, that we may be seeing in the central banking space. So are we witnessing the dawn of a new era of central banking? And if so, uh, what will or should the new normal for central banks look like? And I'm most delighted that um, I'm joined now by a dream lineup to discuss these issues. Uh, we will first have uh, Shamshad Akhtar, who is chair of the board of directors of Kandas uh, Pakistan. And uh, she is actually the former central bank governor of Pakistan and was the first uh, woman to, to fulfill this role. And um, She's also, uh, as a side note, uh, on our global advisory board of our SOA Center for Sustainable Finance. Um, second, we have Danai uh, Kripulu, and I'm very sorry for really bad pronunciation, uh, who is the chief economist and director of research uh, at the Official Monetary and Financial Institutions Forum, OMFIF, uh, which is a stakeholder to the NGFS, the, uh, the Network of Central Banks and Supervisors for Greening the financial system. The third panelist is Nick Robbins, Professor of, finance in, uh, Professor of Practice in Sustainable Finance at the LSE Gransom Research Institute. Uh, and many of you will know that Nick uh, was the co-chair of the UN inquiry into the, into the design of a sustainable financial system, among many other great things that he has done. And last but not least, uh, we have Adam Tooze, who is the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University in New York. Uh, 
um, and a leading progressive voice who's uh, made very important interventions on the role of central banks in both fighting the climate crisis uh, as well as uh, the COVID crisis. We put three guiding questions to all panelists. Um, first one, what should central banks be doing at this point in time to support sustainable recoveries? Second, do you believe that the climate and COVID crisis will lead to a fundamental reset of the practice of central banking? And third, what needs to be the new central bank norm on climate? So let us start with Shamshat, who is not only the former central bank governor of Pakistan and actually also finance minister of Pakistan, uh, but Shamshat also played a leading role as uh, UN Secretary General um, at the United Nations and Executive Secretary of the UN Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, as well as in very senior roles, including Vice President at the World Bank um, and Senior Advisor at the ADB. Um, and there she has been driving the sustainable development agenda. So she's really combining both the central banking and the sustainability perspective. Uh, and we're most delighted to have you. Shamshat, please. Uh, give us your take. And if I could please ask uh, non-speakers to switch off their cameras so that we have only the speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Yuri. Um, it's a pleasure to join all of you, um, such a distinguished uh, group of um, speakers, but at the same time a very informed uh, audience, it looks like. Um, so you were trying to introduce me and it struck me that um, while I was, a, I was a central bank governor, there wasn't a lot of uh, speak on climate change and it's perhaps those old times when central bankers were conservative uh, tremendously and never uh, entered into domains that were not typically theirs. But then when I went to the United Nations and one of the key things that I uh, faced in the United Nations was a crash course on the climate change, which all of us have to do simply because we are such great advocates of climate change. And in that context, um, I do re remember that we are now criticizing that uh, governors uh, who initially have been very uh, conservative and averse to, uh, to talking about climate finance because of exactly the issue you pointed out about my market neutrality that they don't want to influence decisions to one way or the other but then we we do find that um, and and i first hand witnessed this when i was in g20 um, as the sherpa as well as on the finance minister's track where when i talked in my five years uh, about climate change coming from you and and pushing for the agenda they were um, kind of, it's not our business. Uh, and then also when I used the word sustainable finance or SDGs, there was initially a lot of reluctance. However, there was a breakthrough within the G20 itself and some studies were done and all that. So it's not just the central bankers who are also a part of the G20, but there are also the ministers of finance and the Sherpas who are development oriented people where they were, of course, political positioning of one country versus another. We don't want to talk about um, commitments on, on, on climate finance. Now, fast forward it. Your question is, of course, um, what, what's the short and long term view? So my first order is that short and long term priority must be a definitive course correction to achieve the net zero emission target by 2050. And we sometimes forget what are the basic contours, so I'd like to define this, because that net zero emission target by 2050 is critical to reduce the temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade, which I feel personally sitting in Pakistan at 45 degrees centigrade today. Complacency and inaction, of course, are costly. It is encouraging that now generally countries are preparing to enhance their national climate action plans as was confirmed in the June UNFCCC deliberations. Uh, 
and about 121 countries have committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Since I've been in the corridors, my I don't have that much faith uh, in this progress. Uh, and I'm delighted that we are having this discussion because central bankers um, and regulators are a very serious bodies, uh, group of people who will make this hopefully happen if we are able to jointly convince them. So that was my first point. Second is that despite all the cause and evidence, we are still operating on business as usual, irrespective of the governments or the corporates. And they're all falling short currently on the implementation of the NDCs. And world has missed out on the opportunity to deploy the fiscal and monetary recovery support for COVID-19, 2008 crisis, and other crises as and when they have come to invest in green and sustainable recovery. COVID-19 is considered the worst catastrophe to hit the world, resist, resulting in cumulative loss to the global economy as per the World Bank IMF count of over 12 trillion, requiring global fiscal support of $10 trillion. And central banks have cut interest rates, liquidity inject, provided liquidity injections, and restarted the asset purchase programs of larger magnitudes. Climate catastrophe, however, is anticipated to be more devastating, both in nature, scale, and scope. And of course, it does not respect boundaries as much as the COVID seems to uh, have. You can still control cross-border movements of people. So it's best to invest upfront protect our future generation and planet to save from economic and financial losses later. And this logic appeals to the central bankers who deal with money. Hence, you see the growing appetite now of technical work and so on and so forth. So despite signals of global pandemic, economic and climate change episodes, every time we face a crisis, the storyline reemerges we are not prepared. But then our central bankers say, we will do whatever it takes. Of course, funding is needed, but we need to prepare now for climate crisis and make sure that we are showing seeds for sustainable growth and recovery, which demands preferential and priority access to sustainable development. That has an economic architecture that reinforces climate action, both directly and indirectly through specific sector and thematic goals that would make it sustainable climate finance. My third point is that central banks who have already moved to non-conventional approaches to managing their monetary policy mandates, which hasn't happened in the developing world to that extent, have recently also recognized that managing climate risk is critical for monetary and financial stability. Sustainable financial alliances, institutional investors, nonprofit organizations have become strong advocates and joined the ranks of climate financiers. Emphasis being placed by Mark Carney, who is now the special envoy to Secretary General, who we all look up to, has pointed to three key areas, reporting, risk and return, it's welcome, and providing impetus to technical work and thinking. So several central banks have called on banks to report on climate related financial disclosures and require this reporting to be mandatory. And Mark Carney in one of his speeches uh, talks about how many uh, central banks have started to work in that context. But concurrently, there's also the examination going on on the impact of climate risks and returns of companies and their business models. It is emerging to offer scenario analysis while calling companies to define their transition paths to reach net zero emissions. So I'm circling back to my first message. 
to conclude, I have a lot to contribute, but as you said, Yuri, we should come back and not take all the time up front. I think the big question is, what is different this time relative to COVID or others? Of course, in pandemic also, we had a lot of uh, signals. Enough early warning signals have been offered by international scientists on alternate climate scenarios. Uh, there's a lot of technical stuff out there that forewarn global community and technicians to anticipate and prepare themselves. But cracks in multilateralism has weakened solidarity, cooperation, and collective action. Not all is, of course, lost, as there is a coalition of ministers of finance, there is a coalition now of the central bankers, uh, NGFS, who's doing fantastic work, and many more alliances of sustainable climate finance, institutional investors, and advisory bodies like yours. So there's a lot of momentum on technical work, uh, and we don't have to start from scratch. The most instrumental, I believe, is one of your works that um, is uh, uh, the Inspire study, which has been recently released. And it's very instrumental because I remember before that going to each central bank's website to figure out where have what are the regulatory approaches they have, and you've tried to take stock in one place of all that. And I think more of that kind of work will help figure out, is there uh, broadly acceptance and movement or not? And my conclusion is we are far from it. Yes, the advanced ECBs and the central bankers in advanced countries have done a great amount of work, but we are not there if you actually measure uh, how much of the banking sector uh, financing flows are going through the right scrutiny or complying with the ESG standards uh, or for that matter other standards. In contrast, this massive scale of financing coming uh, to meet the goals in uh, Paris Agreement through other sources. So. Um, it will come under discussion that there are sustainable alliances, there are philanthropic organizations, there are multilateral institutions at work. So if you want real change and impact, we have to get these black suited people to start thinking on how they can be the push and the force to force the companies uh, through the banks who are accountable to them but banks have to render companies to be accountable to reject um, the, uh, the transactions which are not compliant with uh, NDCs in their countries, or for that matter, uh, to reject or to, for that matter, deal with the issue of stranded assets. So I'm going to stop here because I, I'd like to hear others too. Thank you, Yuri, for allowing me to speak here. Thank you so much, Shamshad. This, this was really uh, a very, very interesting take. And I, I think your, your, your sense of urgency um, came across very well. And I think that's a very uh, a crucial point. And the question is, what can central banks really do now and, and not just develop tools over the next decade or so while the crisis is unfolding? So uh, let me turn over to uh, Danai. You've been very active in the discussion on central banks um, role in addressing climate change and uh, you've been interacting a lot also with uh, the central banking community. How do you perceive the current discussion in that central banking community and to what extent is the NGFS really shifting uh, the goalpost? Thanks, Uli, and thanks for organizing this discussion. I think this is a, a set of very pertinent topics that you've put to us in terms of what is the role of central banks now at the current point of, in time to drive sustainable recoveries. I think one thing that I would point out uh, is that before this crisis hit, what we were all debating, not just about climate change and central banks, about the role of central banks in general, was what will happen when the next crisis hits? Will central banks have enough ammunition? Is their toolbox going to be empty? Um, are they going to be relevant in the next crisis? And I think what we've seen now with COVID is that 
actually they've been very innovative. They've been able to act. Um, they've acted in a big way. The Fed, the ECB, the Bank of England, major central banks were starting to see quantitative easing programs in emerging markets as well. So I think that's an important thing to kind of start and frame the discussion. The central banks are still very active, important players in a crisis. And I know that Nick will talk more about the specific elements of the toolbox that they have to drive a sustainable recovery. So I won't go into detail there, but what I'd like to frame is the different roles that central banks have, because we can't talk about central banks as a general thing. They have different functions. And one, of course, is monetary policy. And we've heard from Shamstad about this in terms of their quantitative easing and asset purchasing programs. Um, the climate change affects that role in terms of the, the price stability um, inflation expectations, how weather events may be affecting um, uncertainty in predicting and forecasting uh, inflation. There's also the very important role of supervision uh, and regulation, which doesn't sit with central banks in all countries. In some countries, it's separate with supervisory authorities. That's why the NGFS is also involved supervisors, but let's put that in there as well. Um, and then the third area is the reserves and asset management, and central banks um, often we do a, a ranking of this every year and their assets in total are around $40 trillion. So that's a lot of money. They're big players in global capital markets. And also through the reserves management practices, they have climate change considerations in terms of how it affects the returns of their portfolios, the liquidity and the safety of their reserves. And so far, the NGFS um, has approach the, the issue of climate change more through the financial stability risk angle. And I think that's an area that we're really seeing change now. And I think that's important because so far the line from central banks was that this is within our mandate because climate risks could become financial stability risks. So what we are interested in is protecting the financial sector, the institutions we supervise from this climate risks materializing and causing um, uh, financial instability, making the portfolios of companies that we um, that, that are in the financial sector suffer. And we heard from Shamsad about stranded assets, et cetera. And I think now the shift that we're seeing a little bit is that the materiality of risks can also go the other way. So it's not just about what is the risk uh, from an oil price collapse into the portfolio of a company holding, holding an oil asset, but how is a company holding an oil asset contributing to climate change, which can then be a risk to the whole economy? So it's both directions. And I think now with COVID, we're seeing that more strongly because we're seeing how non-financial risks can affect the real economy in ways that matter to the financial sector and how real economy risks can become risks for the financial sector as well. So I think we're seeing that change in mindset a little bit. I think it's happening slowly, but I have seen it in discussions with the NGFS um, that materiality is something that is questioned more than it used to be before. Um, I think another change that we're seeing is that it's no longer a long-term horizon issue. It's something that is affecting, uh, is a risk that is here and now. And I think with COVID, again, this is uh, uh, more important because we're seeing that these non-financial sources of risk can materialize in very direct ways and can be a thing for the, the short term and the medium term. And it's not just something that banks, asset managers, investors can put in their longer term planning horizons. They have to account for these risks now. Um, I think the other thing that is changing a little bit in, in terms of how central banks are thinking about this is also the greater importance of transition risk and how do we deal with transition industries. And I think that's a very tricky point for them to, to focus on because you can't completely divest from industries that need to transition. That would cause financial instability. How do you support industries that need to transition? How do you create a framework around this? What is the right model to do this? Do you do it through buying stakes in, in uh, or equities as a state in these kind of industries and helping them move in a more sustainable direction? If you divest from them completely, if you're a reserves manager um, in a central bank, does that set a leadership for, uh, do you become a leader for others to do the same? We've seen some examples, um, the Swedish central bank, the Riksbank, bank divested from municipal bonds from Canada and Australia because of sustainability concerns. I said they are, they are big players as reserves managers. So divesting completely from certain industries may mean that you leave them up to investors that do not have the same sustainability concerns to invest in. And that could be both in the reserves management side or, or in the asset purchasing programs. I think the Swiss National Bank is a good example there because it's one of the few central banks that has quite a significant equity portfolio. And according to some estimates, the carbon footprint 
of the SMB's equity portfolio is almost as much as the uh, total households in Switzerland. So it has a big footprint. And, and some there also mentioned the, um, the issue of market neutrality that is, um, that is very relevant to central banks. You don't want to be picking specific industries when you conduct monetary policy operations. But at the same time, the SMB in its equity portfolio and reserves um, excludes the banking sector, for example. So, so there are some selection going on. So you could you could argue that market neutrality is a more politically motivated um, concept than something that that cannot be changed. Um, I think also the um, the fact that balance sheets have expanded as a result of this crisis. If you think about what central banks can do now, there's even more, especially the European Central Bank and its asset purchase program. Um, so there is more opportunity to. to uh, al al align these with more sustainability objectives. I think the other big trend in terms of what the NGFS is thinking and where the thinking is shifting is that it's not just about climate change. And I know that in this discussion today, we're focusing more on climate change, but I think that is also important that we're thinking more holistically about sustainability, about the SDGs, how they interact. And again, COVID, I think, has accelerated that shift in thinking about not just climate change, we have to think about biodiversity, we have to think about health as one health, one planet, and we also have to think about the just transition and making sure that by prioritizing um, solving the climate crisis, th those left behind by this transition are also um, thought about and, and it's, it's something that is also covered in the policies. I think in the very immediate response that we're seeing from central banks, there's very, very real debates and, and balancing that central banks have to do between the, the need to provide immediate support to companies that uh, may be facing insolvencies that require credit um, state guarantees, et cetera, versus putting green strings attached to um, to that kind of support. And that's something both for governments and for central banks. Governments may be providing the more direct fiscal support, but central banks are also through regulation supervision may have to face these dilemmas as well. We saw, for example, the Bank of England postpone its climate stress test because it realized that the banking sector had a, a, a lot of other issues to focus on. And it's a question of timing, it's a question of sequencing, and it's it's communicating credibly that you are not letting down this agenda, but you have to prioritize and sequence things in a way that was not anticipated before because of this crisis. The final thing that I would put on the agenda is the issue of how do we actually operationalize this? How do we make it happen in practice? And I think there, there's two main stumbling blocks, as I see it. Both, one is the issue of supply of, um, of assets through which central banks and more conservative investors can invest in to support sustainability. So in the monetary policy portfolio, some central banks own corporate bonds. Um, in their reserves management, most are very much focused on government bonds, um, sovereign bonds. So it's very rare to see central banks invest directly in say sustainable real assets, sustainable infrastructure or private equity. Um, few central banks invest in equities so how can we have more supply of green bonds, for example, which is an asset class that central banks are allowed in their legal frameworks to invest in? How do we package sustainable assets in this way? What market innovation do we need to see to have more scale of that? Because central banks also don't want to crowd out private investors. It's a very small market that of green bonds has grown a lot since the EIB launched the first climate awareness bond in 2007, but it's still very small compared to the overall bond market. So we're seeing more issuances there. And the second stumbling block, I think, is about data. Because how do we include data that can guide these decisions, the common frameworks, common taxonomies, um, etc. So I'll stop there. Um, I think there's a lot to talk about the, the data issue as well. But I look forward to, to listening to the others as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Anaya. This was indeed a very, very, very rich uh, discussion. And there's a lot of points I'm, I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to. Um, so let's turn to, to Nick. Nick, I first met you in 2014 when you were organizing the, the first big inquiry uh, conference in, in Waterloo. And uh, I presented a, a humble paper on the role of central banks in enhancing sustainable finance. And even in that context where we had, you know, the, the, the leading sustainable finance people in the room, there was a lot of skepticism regarding the role of central banks in, in, in addressing climate change, 
being lead agents of, of change in uh, addressing climate risk and so on. And um, you were one of the few people who, who were very clear that central banks really ought to play a leading role and, and need to govern the financial system uh, in this respect. So a couple of years forward, where are we now and where do we need to get to? Well, uh, thanks, Uli, for that introduction. It's really great to, to be on this panel and uh, actually really good to follow both Shamshet and Danai. I think I've set out very clearly the strategic agenda. Maybe if I could pick up from where you started. My sense is we could potentially look at the year we're in 2020 as potentially a hinge uh, year in the sense that we've had perhaps five or six years of central banks acknowledging and increasingly starting to, to act in terms of uh, climate change and, uh, and the broader uh, environmental uh, agenda. Um, and I think recognizing how this fits with their uh, existing uh, mandates, but clearly not just because of uh, COVID, but I think uh, that is propelling us forward, recognizing that we have, uh, let's say the next five or six years could perhaps be as surprising as the last five or six years have been for central banks. How few central bank governors in 2014 or 2015 would have seen action on climate change as part of their, their core uh, mandates and day-to-day and, and -day operations. So I think we should expect that actually that the next five or six years could be equ equally um, surprising in, 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 in many years. So, I mean, one of the things we are facing now is, is, is the COVID uh, crisis. And, and I think what has been striking to, to many of us is how quickly many of the opinion formers around uh, the world, at the IMF, at the ECB, uh, at the UN, uh, and so on, have made very, very clear that we not just need to sort of, uh, build back better, but we need to very clearly uh, orientate uh, the recovery measures, stimulus measures, uh, around a green recovery, around an inclusive recovery, and a just recovery. And, and, the, and the supporters of that have included central banks. Um, which has been, again, I think, uh, quite striking. So leaders from the NGFS uh, and so on. And that's one of the reasons why, Uli, uh, it was a, a pleasure to, to work with you and my colleagues, Simon Dickow at the LSE, to develop this uh, toolbox of uh, crisis response measures, which would, which would enable uh, central banks to uh, make sure that as they were uh, intervening uh, to support uh, the, the financial system and, uh, and prevent uh, financial uh, meltdown and support the economy in this crisis, that those measures also did uh, point us in the right direction in terms of long-term action on climate change and broader a sustainable uh, development. So, so that um, toolbox was uh, prepared as a first, first effort. We've got three broad categories in there, uh, monetary policy tools, uh, prudential tools, and then, and then other tools. And we've done um, a, a, a broad review of all the measures that have been undertaken. I think uh, I'd like to build on what Shamshad was saying earlier, and I think Dan I uh, underlined that. And actually, we have seen in the last three months a, 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 an incredible um, amount of activity from the central banks in terms of the utilization of a variety of tools to provide liquidity uh, to markets. We haven't yet seen that directly linked to climate or environmental goals. We've seen a continuation, I think, of some of the forward momentum, uh, the Philippines Central Bank, uh, Mexico, uh, ECB, and so on, but no direct link um, as yet. I think we see uh, quite a lot of potential for retrofitting some of these, these measures, uh, and particularly potentially to cite uh, areas such as the collateral frameworks, adjusting those uh, in light of, of climate and other environmental risks, refinancing, um, certainly in discussions, we, we've had potentially quite a lot of interesting links between linking sort of green refinancing tools uh, with SME uh, access to liquidity, asset purchases, and also then the portfolio management um, tools as well. So I think there are a number of areas that uh, central banks could 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 uh, focus on at, in the current uh, in 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 the current crisis, and I'll send around a link to participants of of that of that toolbox. But as I say, I think central banks are still really in in crisis re response stabilization mode, and the next phase, perhaps the next three to six months, will be much more about integrating their climate commitments, which they're making, with their their crisis response. If I could maybe look ahead, maybe to the next uh, five or six 
uh, six years uh, and then some of the sort of characteristics we might want to uh, think about. One of the striking things if we're talking at the start about climate change is one of the three goals of the Paris Agreement, as many of you will know, is to make financial flows consistent with low carbon development and resilient uh, development in line with national development uh, priorities. Now, at the moment, I think a number is not clear whose job it is to make sure that that goal is implemented. Clearly, that sits with finance ministries, but in many ways, it sits with central banks and also other financial regulators uh, and supervisors. So I think that one of the areas, as we are now focusing particularly on the net zero goal, will be a clear sense of central banks coordinating with treasuries and finance ministries is what part of that goal within the Paris Agreement lies within their uh, responsibility in, in terms of making sure financial flows are consistent with uh, climate uh, security. Perhaps to, to build on this, I, I think one of the areas will be to understand the central banks, what is their relationship to the net zero goal? Um, certainly in the UK, as part of the proposed uh, stress test from the Bank of England, um, there was a, 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 set of, a set of scenarios for, for, for banks and other institutions to test themselves against, but also a, a requirement for um, individual uh, institutions to uh, pop, pr come forward and, and, and provide the, the global warming potential of their portfolios, banks, insurance companies, uh, and, and others. And, and the Bank of England themselves have just published their own uh, global warming potential for their uh, portfolio. I would see increasingly over the, over the coming years, um, central banks being very clear about what uh, role they have to achieving that net zero goal. And the reason would be very clear that, that, that achieving net zero uh, um, in line uh, with 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2050 is one of the best ways that central banks are going to be able to uh, deliver their core financial stability goals. All the evidence I think is showing very clearly that uh, warming uh, beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius will put quite severe pressure and make it very difficult for central banks to deliver their financial stability goals. Increasingly, I think we're going to be seeing far more disruption uh, as the decades go on, if we allow a hothouse world uh, to develop the scenarios published by the NGFS this week pointed to a 25% uh, reduction in, in GDP um, if, if we go ahead with un, un, unrestricted uh, global warming. In developing countries, the poorest 40% uh, percent of, of countries in the world, that rises to about 75%. So clearly fairly catastrophic for the development potential of the majority of, of the world. So I think that sense of saying the role of the central bank, central bank has, has a role in delivering net zero to achieve financial stability, potentially will be one of the characteristics of the next five years. The second is then that um, clearly there's been a lot of um, progress in terms of setting expectations of regulated firms, in terms of improving disclosure requirements, stress testing and so on. But I think we'll, we're close to the situation where on a precautionary basis, uh, we could start to see adjustments of risk weights, particularly for high carbon, uh, high risk uh, assets, particularly coal, which we know as a global market has already peaked a number of, of years ago and therefore faces substantial market risk as well as, as climate risk. So I think that will be another aspect as a complement alongside these sort of data and disclosure uh, tools. Uh, Dan, I also already mentioned this uh, in the, the network for greener financial system is greening. Uh, so that is obviously thinking about issues beyond climate. So air pollution, water pollution, soils, uh, nature and so on. And I think that is one of the issues that COVID has taught us is the integrated nature of uh, climate and, 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 and the broader natural capital issues. So I'd expect uh, central banks to, to expand their focus to that broader range of the environmental agenda. And then also to uh, the, the, the social aspects of the transition as well. And, and Dan I has mentioned this and also Uli and your remarks about this question of the just transition. A number of central banks do have uh, dual mandates, uh, a stability mandate uh, as monetary authorities and also an employment mandate. And I think there would be some interesting roles for central banks to play to ensure that uh, the recovery and transition uh, is is not just fast uh, and stable and orderly, but also is fair and just from an employment 
uh, and, and inclusion uh, points of view. And then a fifth point, perhaps, um, is the question of the, the, the assets that uh, central banks will hold on their balance sheets. Uh, Dan, you touched on this, but I think there's a very interesting role that central banks could play, particularly in the sovereign bond market. Um, obviously, that, that comes back to the question of fiscal monetary uh, coordination. But one of the things that I think is very clear is we have the beginnings of a disclosure regime for corporate assets, but within the TCFT, there is no similar or equivalent uh, disclosure framework for sovereign bonds. And I think both private holders of sovereign bonds and indeed uh, official sector holders of sovereign bonds would increasingly need to see uh, disclosure frameworks around that, not least if you're trying to achieve a net zero goal. And I think there could be some very interesting uh, discussions between uh, sovereign bonds as purchase, sorry, central banks as purchases of sovereign bonds and uh, their finance ministries to increasingly ensure that all issuance of sovereign bonds is aligned with the Paris Agreement uh, and with the Sustainable Development Goals. So that's a really a clear objective that we're moving as the niche for uh, sovereign bonds, green so sovereign bonds into the, main, the mainstream. So those are sort of five areas I think that could characterize one, uh, central banks recognizing their role in achieving net zero from a financial stability pr perspective, precautionary a tightening of uh, risk weights, particularly around high carbon assets, uh, extension to, to the nature agenda, the just transition, and then the sovereign bonds. And I think that, that really is a closing point is uh, a, a question really about the culture of, of central banks, this question of uh, the conventional wisdoms. Obviously, these are very important um, for the, the integrity and coherence of central banks, this question of market neutrality. How does that sit um, when we are in a situation of profound market failure in the climate, case of climate change and other environmental issues? And then I think really a, a, an issue will be around the capacity, the skill sets, the behaviors, and, and indeed the professional culture of central banks, so that uh, these issues are not seen as, as marginal, but really core to the, the purpose of being a 21st century central banker. So thanks very much. Thanks a lot, Nick. I think the, the your closing point about the, the culture of thank, uh, central banking is really a key one. And, um, uh, and I think, that's also something where, where Adam can follow up nicely. Um, Adam, you, as an economic historian, uh, I think you, you can give us a bit of a, a long-term perspective on how central banking has changed over time um, and, and what changes may uh, lie ahead of us. Um, so as we've already pointed to, central banking is not just uh, kind of one set uh, uh, of principles, but, but uh, it is, changing, uh, there are different central banking cultures. Um, how do you place the current changes we may be seeing uh, in this bigger picture? Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Uli. I hope you can hear okay. Is this working okay? Okay, okay excellent. Uh, and to be on this, onto this panel with uh, people who have devoted much more of their career to actually engaging with central banking. Uh, than, than I have. Um, and so I, I really, I feel, come to the conversation somewhat as, a, as, a, as an outsider, but as a very concerned and interested commentator, and one indeed who does view the current moment from the point of view of a historical perspective, which in the case of central banking in its modern form has to go back half a century to the, to the 1970s at least. Um, but I thought I would start by simply in relation to the questions that you asked us earlier about what we think normatively the objectives of central banks ought to be at this moment. I think the fundamental question is how urgent do we think this problem is uh, and how urgent do we think key decision makers think this problem is and I think the answer that Nick and Dane and Shamshad have given us is that um, people are beginning to wake up and smell the coffee there is a sense as then I put it that this isn't a problem of the long term or even the medium term but this was an immediate problem Shamshad has described you know in essentially a generational experience of coming to terms with this and Nick has obviously been a driver of that uh, but I think from all of them also, we got the simple message that the trajectory that we're currently on is disastrous. So, you know, the bias in all of my answers to the questions that Uli posed is we need to do more. We need to do it more urgently. What we're currently doing is not enough. Whatever we're currently doing is not radical enough, as remarkable as it may be that we're even in the place that we're at. And clearly, 
it has been a spectacular change over the last five years in what central banks are willing to do on this agenda. But that has got to be the premise, is that you know whatever we're doing isn't enough um, because the current crisis is is spectacular and and um, is coming towards us with absolutely enormous speed and on a huge scale. And clearly, this is a global problem. And so coming as I do from an advanced economy kind of background, we have to absolutely step uh, beyond the shadows of thinking endlessly about the mandates of the ECB or the troubled history of the Federal Reserve or whatever, because this problem needs to be tackled at least at the G20 level globally. And so we need to have resets in the policies of all of the major uh, global central banks, the G20 plus basically a key to making this work if it is going to work. So I think those would be two preliminary statements. Um, the next kind of preliminary kind of remark I would make is when we say, what do we want to change about central banking? Um, perhaps it would be useful to think about what the paradigm is that we want to shift. And, and Danae and Nick in particular spelled out in, in detail, as it were, what the elements of the moves are. And there are certain key terms that recur, neutrality being one of them. And I think that's not haphazard that's not coincidental right because the modern panorama of central banking the possibility of talking about global central banks in the way that we are here is the result of the rollout of a particular type of central banking in the 1990s across the post-cold war world and the adoption of that paradigm and that paradigm had certain certain key ideas that were linked to it and they form a structure and the question is how can we shift this and what is entailed in shifting this structure and I think the key terms, and they'll be familiar to all of us who are involved in central bank discussions at any time, are independence as the absolutely sort of bedrock of what central bankers are, which is why we can talk about them as a group. They are an entity and they have independence. One could discuss what that actually means. Part of their independence and part of their license to be independence is they have a limited remit. And classically, of course, that was inflation fighting, and that's why they were independent. Um, and then, as Dan has pointed out, their actual roles have proliferated dramatically. Um, they also profess neutrality, and I think that has a double edge. In other words, they're, in, they're not picking winners. They don't engage in the sort of crypto industrial policy. And they are also, as Dan was pointing out, managers of a global system. So they don't engage in various types of classically anyway, the 1990s paradigm central bank does not engage in foreign exchange controls or capital controls. So that's another aspect of its neutrality. And all of that then licensed, and this is where we wrap back on the notion of independence, all of this was written into something that we refer to as a mandate, which is essentially, if you like, the contractual delegation to this group of technocratic, non-elected officials of certain tasks by whoever the political sovereign is. And classically, paradigmatically, in an advanced economy context, this is a question of the delegation of democratic authority. Uh, of course, not all states are democratic, and so in those places, independence might mean something quite different. It might mean, for instance, I don't know, independence from a kleptocratic elite in the eyes of the IMF. But classically, the central bank independence paradigm is delegation from a democratic sovereign. So this is tied up quite tightly with the wave of democratic change that happened across the world in the 1990s. So when we talk about shifting the mission of central banks in relation to climate change, I think the question that we have to tackle and we ought to tackle it as, as directly as we can is which elements of this package do we want to shift? And often when you make proposals about green addenda to central bank policy, you will find a kind of double edged pushback, which is you're threatening our independence, you're widening our mandate too much, or you're empowering unelected, uh, unelected technocrats to do things that they really ought not to be doing. And I think if we're to uh, avoid that kind of opposition on what needs to be a journey of quite radical change, uh, we need to tackle that head on. But before I go there, because I think that's ultimately a political question and that's where I want to end up, I think we also need to address, and both, in fact, everyone has spoken about it, but I think we need to address it head on, which is that neutrality has to fall. Um, neutrality is one of the anchoring ideas which basically allowed massive central bank policy, but within a frame of market conformity, um, has to be problematized. We need to question what it means. We need to ask what authorities license what neutrality is. Often it's tied, for instance, to rating agency evaluations. We need, as Nick was saying, to question what 
what neutrality means with regard to markets which are exhibiting absolutely catastrophic market failure or just non-conformity with the announced targets of the government so if we're on we're trying to go for decarbonization and we're aiming for a 1.5 degree path and as we know from the work of park carney and others the markets are pricing a four degree world is there not then a mandate of intervention so i think neutrality is one of the principles that has to be questioned directly this is where as it were things will get difficult in the conversation and where one can imagine resistance coming because neutrality was a key element in the package of central bank independence from the early 90s onwards because it suggested the central bank was not going to illegitimately muddle mess around with market judgments um, we can't we don't if we let's take if, it, if we accept that we are actually in an emergency situation and if we accept that we're there in part as a market failure we can't as it were then also go along with neutrality but let me come in concluding to what i take to be the absolutely fundamental point which is that we need to think about the politics of these actions and we need to think about the politics that you know what is it that we're actually asking central bankers to do and how are we legitimizing them to do it and I think there's a there's a sort of lack of clarity here in part because there's a lack of history as to how this set of mandates emerged. And in some cases, they were kind of consensual. In some cases, they were foisted on countries by the requirements of external lenders who demanded that central banks conform to international standards in the core countries the advanced economy of countries, the Europeans and the Americans, independence is actually the result of manifest social and political conflict in which the central bankers adopted positions which were antagonistic to the interests of considerable groups in society. The most classic instance is Paul Volcker's shock in 1979. This ruined the American labor movement. It did huge damages to large parts of the American manufacturing industry. It's why the idea of neutrality smacks rather oddly in the mouth of anyone who knows anything about the Fed's history. It has in fact been a powerful transformative actor. Now I think one of the things that we need to be clear about in thinking about central banks role with regard to the climate problem is what vision we have of change. I mean is it one in which NGOs and activists push reluctant central bankers to adopt mandates they don't want to adopt? In which case what are the levers that we have to push? What are the things that we need to have to take away or add? Does this come from Parliament saying to central bankers, we're changing your mandate, this is what it's going to look like? Do we have a model of, as it were, consensual elite change, which I think is what most of us are most comfortable with, and many of them in this, in this group will embody? Or can we conceive, what are the circumstances under which we might consider it legitimate for central bankers to play what has been their historic role, um, which is to do, if you like, a Volcker-style shock um, which is to say, no, we're changing the terms. And yes, I, as an unelected official with a mandate that I've got, consider myself legitimated to radically change the terms, as we have done in the past. And that is what, in fact, founded the myth of central banking in the past. That's very uncomfortable and it's quite problematic. And it involves a degree of myth making because it involves burying some of the casualties under the carpet later, which is what has happened very much with the Paul Volcker legacy. But I think if we're going to think about how serious this crisis is, and how urgent the changes are that we might need, there might be a case for thinking seriously about what that kind of technocratic leadership on these kind of issues would look like. How you would create it politically is a different issue. How you would legitimate it is also quite problematic, but it would certainly no longer be the model of a kind of consensual technocratic change, which I think we hanker after too much. And if this crisis is as urgent as it is, we may need to abandon too. Wow, this was a real tour de force, Adam. Thank you so much. And, and I think you made very clear that uh, tinkering at the edges, you don't really consider an option. So I think you raised a lot of questions that uh, are not very often uh, raised in, in, in these discussions, but, but which I think have to be uh, addressed, really. Um, so I would like to invite uh, the other panelists, or kind of all panelists, to, to do one round, so starting in the same order, um, to chip in, comment on, on what your fellow panelists have said, agree, disagree, raise new questions or answer questions that others have asked or not asked. Um, so let, let's do a quick round. And uh, I also encourage uh, our audience to, to send in uh, questions through the chat function. Uh, so we can bring them uh, to the panel. Um, Shamshat, 
Um, do you want to yeah. add a bit more? Right. Um, I think it was a fascinating to hear all of colleagues out here, the panelists, and everybody uh, distinctly brought what I would call additionality to the debate. Um, and uh, I think uh, I'm struck by um, uh, what I see is a lot of agreement with uh, each of the panelists. And let me start with uh, Dene, who was dot on. I think um, uh, in, in, I'll just pick up one point, uh, which was related to um, how central banks invest uh, from their balance sheets or the reserves that uh, they are custodians of at a country level. Um, I think uh, this has been my issue too that you know you have to lead by example and if central banks are going to enter into the business of seriously supporting climate finance and we are talking about huge amounts that will be needed for climate finance if COVID is any um, example to go by, which is of a smaller scale, um, in my view, uh, relative to what uh, climate change will, will bring. And I speak uh, based on experience of the disasters that I have personally confronted and been there as a part of the rescue team. That you know, when you have a disaster, a climate change related disaster or whatever disaster, you basically see everything wiped out, everything wiped out on the earth. Now, you can't stand back and say, this is my mandate or not my mandate. Uh, and we need to deploy all the alternate funding sources we have. And central banks now, after a few rounds of crisis, have been equipped with a lot of new um, way of thinking, new tools, new instruments. So we should do more innovations. And given the size uh, uh, of the holdings these central banks have, now I know what central bank reserves mean and what balance sheet of central bank means. I mean, we're not talking about Tajikistan central bank's balance sheet. We are talking about bigger uh, central bank's um, uh, balance sheets. Uh, and it's not that uh, aligning yourself with sustainable finance will destabilize the financial strength of a, of, a, of a central bank. It would actually reinforce if the sustainable finance transaction is done effectively. And that's why you need um, very high powered climate scenario analysis to be able to relate to investments that you are undertaking, whether it's big money from institutional investors or big money from central banks. So I do feel central banks need to lead by example, by deploying their own funds. And I, as I said, they have missed an opportunity because this asset purchase program was another example. And if you look at the first round of asset purchase program of EU, it was invested, almost 60% of it invested for, was invested in the high polluters rather than, so we didn't even take care um, to screen what assets we were investing in. So I think they have a moral responsibility, whether they have a mandate or not, you know, legal issues aside, they have a moral responsibility. So that was a point that I, I'm totally in sync um, uh, with uh, Dana. Then um, Nick has touched upon several things. Um, and, uh, but I'd like to share with you a little from a developing country context. Now, obviously, NGF has em emerged um, as, as a body and uh, IMF is also an observer has an observer status. There are lots of other entities that are supporting NGF. So it's a coalition, which is um, a coalition of some of the advanced countries or emerging market central banks. Now, what do you do with the developing countries? Now, the sophistication that's going to come from NGFS is a very welcome development because it is talking about um, uh, mainstreaming 
uh, the impact of climate change in the decisions on mo monetary stability. I mean, it says it in much more sophisticated manner, but because our audience would be also people who may not be an economist. So I'm trying to translate this because I think climate stuff has to be talked about in a simple manner so that everybody understands. So if, the, if we agree that um, climate change um, has to be also viewed as a monetary stability and a financial stability, I think that we have to really be uh, looking at what different buckets of central banks can do because there will be a lot of diversity. What may uh, work for say Europe may not necessarily withstand when you come to a developing country. And let me make this point a little more clearer. There are of course a wide array, array of uh, prudential regulations that have already emerged and they are giving uh, weights to the brown assets, uh, penalizing them and giving positive uh, weights, so to speak, or incentivizing the green finance. Now, that's the track that the low income developing countries have opted for. So there isn't a major transformational mindset that has occurred. And I bring this that while we are talking about big debates, about the mandates, it gets more complicated when you have ECB, which is a conglomeration of like several central banks. But when you have an individual small central bank, irrespective of what the legal mandate was, it was doing all this stuff that is now being thought as very innovative, refinancing. I used to do it, okay, refinancing. It's, it has an impact on monetary uh, stability because monetary easing uh, aggravated the macroeconomic and caused a lot of macroeconomic complications. But refinancing is rampant uh, in, in developing country contexts. It may be a new thing relatively, but it's, uh, it's the bread and butter uh, of the developing countries because there is no fiscal space to stimulate the economy or to, uh, to uh, uh, or also with the banks, they don't have the liquidity. Providing liquidity support to central banks, what is it? We can say it is a mandate of the central banks so, so that the banking system doesn't get destabilized. But, you know, I mean, what we, did we do during the financial crisis? Loaded a lot of rich banks with the liquidity. Uh, who was paying for it? Taxpayers. So the central banking business has changed. And, uh, you know, this historical um, discussion that Adam had is fascinating. And I hope that we can read some of his stuff. I haven't actually read his stuff. But the bottom line is central banks have been doing community programs. Central banks have been doing everything on sun and earth. And different central banks have had different strategies. So I think we should try to push the envelope regarding the mandate a little bit, because, um, when when you have climate disaster, then, then everything is, else is at stake. I mean, when I was in Indonesia, I was actually um, a, a director um, uh, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, context of um, uh, sorry. In uh, um, I was very much uh, worried about what was going on when everything was burning as a result of the crisis that we all faced uh, during the disaster in Indonesia. And everything was burnt when you went there. Um, and it was a lot of um, important people who went for the rescue. Everything was burnt. Now you could have different debates saying, should I do this and should I not do this? Should it be funded from a fiscal support or should it be funded from the local or municipal government? No time. 30,000 life bodies were buried in a, in a hole that was just created. Ban Ki-moon was there. I was there from Asian Development Bank. We were just thinking on how to handle this crisis, which was a disaster, all the land, all the oil, everything was there. So I'm saying we need to prepare 
most of my uh, comments that when I was writing, I think prevention and preparation is important. And every time, as I said, when we have a crisis, everybody says, oh, we have, we need to, uh, we should, we knew about it, but we haven't prepared. And yet uh, we go ahead and provide um, pretty generous um, uh, kind of, um, uh, pretty generous liquidity for a variety of reasons. So I'm going to stop here. Uh, there's a lot one can talk about climate change and how we need to do things differently. Um, uh, and how climate finance could help, uh, you know, all this uh, work that's been done on the regulatory frontier is fascinating because after all, we've all gone through the Basel, how to standardize uh, Basel for all types of economies and developing versus developed countries. So standardization, of course, will eventually help in, but also um, figuring out how do you manage risk and return in an effective manner is quite critical also. Thank you. Well, thank you, Shamshad. Again, some very profound points. And I think um, you're highlighting that, uh, you know, there isn't, in fact, this one central banking model is very important. And even though, as Adam rightly pointed out, there has been since the uh, late 80s, early 90s, this kind of inflation targeting um, model that was promoted also by international financial institutions around the world, and many countries have adopted this, but um, there have been indeed very different central banking traditions. And even though quite a lot of central banks in developing countries adopted inflation target, uh, targeting on paper, uh, in practice, uh, there has been a lot of mu uh, much more pragmatism uh, because also the, the immediate needs for central banks to support, uh, say, financial market development or kind of industrial policies uh, of governments uh, and, and also issues like financial inclusion have been always uh, on the agenda in, in most developing countries. So I think that that's a very important point. And of course, again, uh, the, the emphasis that uh, during crises like right now, we're facing right now, things are possible that, that we're just, you know, we were told are not possible before. So, um, but let me turn on uh, turn over to to uh, Danae to to add her uh, second round thoughts. Thanks, Uli. Yeah, it's been fascinating to hear everyone speak. I've learned so much from all of you. Thank you. I'm conscious that a lot of questions are coming through, so I'll keep it brief because I think these are also really interesting. I've been looking at them. Um, I'll pick up on just one point, and, and I think Shamsa also mentioned it. And when I talked about the, the kind of different roles of central banks, monetary policy, supervision and reserves, I think we can add a fourth one, which is the showing leadership in the area of financial um, uh, markets and kind of acting as role models and really driving the agenda because of the expertise they have more than the tools as well. And kind of showing the way and, and, and working together with other central banks globally. I think the NGFS is a good example there where perhaps we've had less progress on the government side. And I think the standards and taxonomies is very important there. And, and Nick pointed it, this out about the kind of brown and risk uh, and green risk asset weightings. And, and Shams had mentioned it now as well. And I think when we think about the green supporting factors or brown penalizing factors, green and brown taxonomies, what can the role of central banks be there? Again, it's a very difficult question for them because they're saying, well, we don't have enough data to show that green is risk free. So we don't want to be uh, lowering capital requirements for a particular asset class when we don't have the evidence. And I think the big question there is, will we ever have the data to, to be able to do this? Do we have enough time to wait for it? How do we resolve that dilemma? And I know that kind of in our community, more on the academic and watcher side, the brown penalizing factors and brown taxonomies are perhaps um, more um, popular, but on, in the banking sector, you see the kind of green supporting factors being something that, um, that, that is being argued for. And in China, we've already seen it happen. And I think the, the elephant perhaps in the room is also a very big political jurisdiction where the climate agenda is not as much uh, advanced. And when you have a big capital markets players that, that is lacking in these standards, then you will start to see the market developing their own. Because if you don't have that leadership from from the regulators, from the government, and you, you know investors, um, investors know that if my central bank or my government doesn't care about this, but the ECB or the Bank of England does, and I'm operating in those jurisdictions as well, I have to do something about it. 
then they will start coming up with their own standards. And I think that's dangerous in terms of the fragmentation that we may see. I think central banks have a role there to kind of resolve that dilemma a little bit. Yes, we have different um, different settings in different countries, and it may be the political preferences. It may also be the different ways companies and financial systems are set up, say more state-owned companies in China versus different, different setups in, in other countries. So you do have to have a little bit of difference. But I think that fragmentations versus um, fragmentation versus harmonization is, is a difficult thing for, for central banks to resolve. And when you read at the, the very first NGFS report that said, well, we, we don't think the ratings agencies rating sufficiently cover the, the risks, the climate risks in the, in the assets, but at the same time, they use these ratings for their asset purchase programs then again, is there a room for central banks to develop their own or what progress can they expect from ratings agencies to, to be able to, to guide them in their own asset purchases? So I think that is another interesting question going forward, but I'll leave it there because I see uh, more questions coming through. Thank you, Danai. Um, Nick, over to you. Thank you, I'm fascinated to hear how uh, Adam's going to answer the question about uh, enlightened green technocracy. So I know that's what you're holding out for that one. Um, and lots of lots of uh, good good points. If I if maybe pick up um, from the from the chats and the, the comments, uh, Jörg Haas on, commenting on Carbon Tracker's latest decline and fall uh, report about the, the the energy system. And that's why I think this this question. Um, uh, maybe is a, again the way how we present this issue of, of, of green and climate and so on that often I think it's it's could be it's, could be seen by some of the by central bankers who obviously are, are busy with many things as being uh, outside of scope because it's largely a, a, a sort of ethical or moral uh, issue but if you look at the scale of the transformation in the energy system that is now uh, underway with tens of billions of impairments uh, happening in in, in recent uh, recent days uh, and weeks with the global coal market already peaked the oil market probably peaks too and gas coming coming soon um, then these are going to cause quite sort of systemic uh, disruptions so i think there's again if we are focusing on some of those core and very uh, sort of uh, core issues which really go to the heart of of economics and financial stability then i think there is a, a case for precautionary action now and then on the other side Again, as Shamsad was saying, particularly for developing and emerging economies, um, thinking about the, the, the impacts of climate change already, which already are hitting GDP uh, and, and, and well-being. Um, one of the themes that comes out in the question, I think, from uh, Anne uh, Lursha was about how climate risks um, can be uh, picked up in sort of sovereign bond uh, ratings and how that is compatible with questions of just transition. I think, Uli, uh, a piece of very fine research you did a couple of years back was showing in a sense that there is a, a, a paradox that as markets um, uh, become aware of climate risks and start crystallizing those in, for example, in, in credit ratings and other forms of, of capital pricing, then actually, particularly in terms of physical risks, that could mean that the cost of capital for developing countries actually rises, that these countries uh, least uh, contributing to the problem, most uh, exposed. And because of their vulnerability, um, they are actually facing rising cost of capital. So again, that suggests potentially at a, at a global point of view, but also maybe nationally, that purely thinking about um, a market only uh, way of integrating climate risk is going to generate uh, issues about uh, economic and, and, and social um, uh, justice in terms of how those aspects are addressed. Um, and Pick as well also uh, pointed to this issue of, of inclusive and just transition. And I think that is something that we will be working on certainly at the LSE and we're delighted to work with others, really thinking about the, the sort of how the so maybe the employment uh, aspects of some central banks can be matched with this uh, climate, uh, climate issue. Um, I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Adam, over to you. I just wanted to start by saying that um, I absolutely loved um, Shamshad and Uli's sort of pushback on a excessively advanced economy uh, focused discussion here. I take that point absolutely. I took it to be implicit in what I was saying. There's something extraordinarily artificial and historically aberrant about the construction of the 1990s advanced economy central banking paradigm. 
because the Bank of England used to do all of the things that we're talking about too. The Bank of France was doing them down to the 1980s, picking winners, doing various types of industrial finance. The, 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 I mean, to, to use a slogan and to cut it short, basically the, the, the central banking paradigm I'm talking about is a particular version of advanced economy neoliberalism, neoliberalism that gained hegemony in the 1980s and 1990s. It was always a bad description of what central banks were going to do in the most of the world. It has broken down in the advanced economies and it's a historically brief ellipse. And my point is essentially, let's free ourselves from that so that we can, as it were, in a much more pragmatic way, simply ask what we want to use this incredibly powerful tool for. But we should recognize that that involves overcoming what are now quite entrenched notions, and indeed in the European context, entrenched legal conceptions um, that do need overcoming. Um, so I completely d'accord. In terms of post-colonial criticism, this would be, as it were, a move to provincialize the Bundesbank or the Federal Reserve model, and that would be that would be indeed what we should be doing. And clearly, the, you know, if on the one hand, as Dana incredibly um, tactfully remarked, there is as a missing elephant, which is the Fed. At the other end of the spectrum, of course, there is the People's Bank of China, the new game in town, if you like, that is a completely pre-liberal, post-liberal, just non-liberal actor, which mobilizes the entire resources of the massive Chinese power apparatus to do whatever Beijing is pushing and to manage all of the ensuing problems. So. Uh, this, I think, is exactly the, the space that we need to be in, a discussion about central banks beyond the pieties of the 1990s, and the more quickly we can let go of those, the better. And as much as I have respect for the likes of Mark Carney, the limits of his reform program are precisely that, as it were, he is one of the great exponents of that paradigm, and that does constrain what he's going to be able to do. The most, the, the nub question, and Nick pointed it out, that Daniela Gabor unsurprisingly put to me from the, from the audience is, okay, so if we're going to do this, like if we imagine ourselves a green Paul Volcker, um, somebody who will break things and move fast because he understands there is a crisis and therefore this is a historic turning point and where, where is the action here? Where, where does that energy come from? Um, this is indeed the crucial question, and I don't know that there's a good answer. And to that extent, this suggestion is to some extent a, uh, uh, a council of despair. And I, I, would, I would admit that. Um, why? Because we have to be clear about what the very powerful interests were that sat behind that paradigm that emerged over the course of the 80s and the 90s. It's not just something that was spun up by a group of technocrats or that was simply the legacy of German neoliberalism from the middle of the 20th century. This, after all, is the counterpart to what other people using another slapdash term know as financialization. This sort of central banking is the counterpart to the hypertrophic growth of the financial sector. And those were the interests that, broadly speaking, it helped to instantiate. Daniel refers to, you know, capture and the problem of greenwashing. That too is the, the demon that needs the monster that needs slaying. And it's not obvious where the political forces for that kind of reform program come from at the same strength and with the same capacity that they came out of conservative politics and, you know, neoliberal versions of social democracy in the 1980s and 1990s. So it's not clear to me that we do have a good answer for that. And to that extent, we may be involved in various kinds of improvisation to get us through this phase of crisis. And they may involve the kind of thing that Yerk referred to. You know, sufficiently scary reports may convince powerful people that they do indeed have an interest in moving because things are going to break. Big things are going to happen whether you like it or not, and you may need to be ahead of the game. But I think that is the political challenge. And Dana referred to it in a question she posed as well. How do you build the political constituency powerful enough to say, we are now going to change the mandate. We want to change the terms of the central banking paradigm. And it may be because I'm coming from the United States where this question is completely open and the politics are very bare knuckle and the basic principles, there is no consensus. Um, but I think that conflictual element is what I want to put on the table. There's a sense in which the conversation in Europe and in the more sophisticated emerging market and developing world actors is too polite um, because it takes for granted the level of agreement that is not there in the rougher edge places of the world and below the surface may also not be there in some of the more bien pensant corners. And when the going gets tough and the choices are more difficult, that resistance will re-manifest itself in, in the sense that the, you know, neutrality will be a harder principle to give up than people imagine, and it will be harder to, as it were, penalize brown assets than to stimulate green assets. And this is not by accident because powerful interests are engaged. 
So I take the force of the point, I don't really have an easy answer for it, but the, the suggestion from history is that we need to encompass the full range of possible actions that central bankers have taken, and those include this kind of pioneering, ice-breaking role. It isn't just simply give us a mandate and then we'll act as good technocrats. There has been politics there. And we, given the urgency, it goes back to the original move, is the crisis as urgent as we think it is, then do we derive legitimacy from that? Are we willing to do a ends justify means type move? Because if we're as is the climate crisis is as serious as we think it is, then how can we escape that kind of logic? Um, that is, I think, you know, the, the question that, because somebody like Paul Volcker certainly believed that the ends justified the means. So, um, Wojtek Kalinowski suggested that maybe Christine Lagarde, maybe the new Paul Volcker, and that she, she's actually not an economist, um, and uh, that, that she, she really is a political person. So, I mean, that remains to be seen. Um, but it is indeed interesting to, to, to note that quite a lot of people uh, who have been pushing uh, the climate or sustainability agenda in the central banking space are not economists. So if we think of Frank Elderson, he, he's a lawyer, you know, uh, the chair of the NGFS. And, and um, uh, so maybe, maybe it actually takes a non-economist to, to, who's not brought up in, uh, you know, kind of this rather narrow thinking about central banking uh, to, to make this change. But um, so we have a bit of a problem now in so far as we still have a lot of very good questions, uh, but we have only nine minutes left. And I would like to use these nine minutes to um, pass the floor again to each of you for a very quick comment on what you think needs to be done now. So uh, be it either kind of in, in very uh, uh, short term thinking or, or kind of do we need kind of a, a new Bretton Woods where everyone gets together or whatever. But so what are the kind of, if, if you could take one action uh, to bring to the central bankers agenda, what would that be? Um, and I maybe start again with, with Shamshat. Jump shot. Well, um, or maybe maybe someone else want, wants to to have a go. Which jump shot? I don't know. Yeah, I can come in and also just comment on what you said about Christine Lagarde because I think it's a really interesting. It was a really interesting appointment, and we knew that the ECB was political before her appointment. I mean, a lot of the the euro is a political project, and we saw that throughout the euro area crisis. I think her appointment confirmed what was implicit and made it very explicit that you. Um, that you that a lot of these discussions are political, and I think it opens the way to thinking about these issues that, as as we've discussed, uh, require a more political change in mindset. I think you mentioned lawyers, uh, politicians. I think bringing in more scientists into central banks is also an important action point, and how we can create more multidisciplinary teams because a lot of this understanding of climate risks and the uh, interpretation of data of climate scenarios you need to have. It's not just greenwashing in terms of the products. There's also a lot of competence greenwashing going on. You know, do you, does it mean if you're an economist and you do a short sustainability course that you're qualified to kind of be part and make, make these decisions? How do you integrate um, the different skills that you need? So I think that would be one action that central banks can do. I think in terms of the, the monetary policy side, we're seeing some strategic reviews. The ECB is having a strategic review coming up, um, how you can integrate climate risks there. And I think the, the other change is what I mentioned at the very beginning. It's not just about the risks to the financial sector. It's also the risk that the financial sector can have um, on ESG issues. And it doesn't mean that as long as the financial sector is safe and the planet is being destroyed, central banks are going to be okay with that. And I think that shift in, in how they approach the issue needs to happen. Because what we've seen from the NGFS so far is that it's within our mandates because they're financial stability risks. And I think we need to move beyond that. Um, and I think it's a big question how we allow them to do that in a legitimate way. But I think there is a lot of scope and flexibility in the, in the way their mandates are set up. I mean, if you think about pri uh, price stability, you can bring climate change into this. If you think about reserves management and the need for safe 
safety and liquidity and, and returns there, then again, you can bring that in. So I think we are, we've seen a lot of progress and I want to end on a more optimistic note because we've said about what we're not doing right and the kind of political problems and the blockers, but the progress that we've seen from central banks in this space, I mean, the NGFS from being set up in December 2017 to now has grown to so many members, has published so many reports. It's been much faster than other financial regulation that we've seen before when you consider kind of how slow the Basel Committee on banking supervision has been on, on other standards since the previous financial crisis. I think we should also give some credit to kind of the dynamism that we're seeing in central banks and hope that this will be accelerated even further. Well, thank you. Um, Nick, do you want to go next? Yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I think uh, maybe it, it, it seems a little bit sort of narrow, but I would think uh, it w the, the, if there was one thing, uh, central banks should a, adopt a clear policy on their role in delivering net zero from a financial stability um, way, uh, from a financial stability perspective. And I think that fits with this dynamic of, let's say, sort of reciprocal signaling that has been going on in the sense that the Bank of England moved when it was clear that there were actors in the financial system, banks and insurers and investors who recognised that they actually could not respond effectively to climate change because it was a systemic issue and therefore you did need both action by in the real economy but also action in the financial system. Large pension funds, asset owners, banks are adopting net zero goals and actually the central banks need to reciprocally adopt goals themselves and I think pursue net zero by 2050 as part of their financial stability objective. They clearly can't do all of it or indeed most of it. Um, that, that lies with, with finance ministries and, and the real economy, um, but they clearly have to have to set a very clear sort of sign about that that's the target they're aiming for. And then I would think many, many other things uh, will follow after that. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And I think that also resonates with a comment by Jörg Haas, who pointed to this climate tracker analysis and basically suggesting that if, if any of that is true and, and the financial risks are as big as portrayed in the climate tracker report, then certainly uh, financial stability mandates will deliver, uh, deliver a, lo a lot of scope to intervene. And my personal interpretation would also be that, um, I mean, even if we look at the ECB, the ECB mandate uh, does indeed provide a lot of scope. So I think it's not only about legal mandates as in their written form, but also very much about interpretation. Uh, so, and that, that is basically also very much linking to the point that, that Adam made about uh, paradigms. And because, I mean, as any, any lawyer knows, you know, any legal text you can interpret in, 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 in different ways. You just need to make sure that, that you interpret it in a, in a watertight way. Okay, that's kind of an economist take now on law. But anyway, uh, Adam, over to you. I, I think it's telling that both Jay Powell and Lagarde uh, uh, are lawyers. Um, we're in a kind of post-wonk um, central banking world right now, uh, as far as those two are concerned. Anyway, it's quite a, it's no longer the world of the Ben Bernankes um, and the Mervyn Kings and so on, which is an ind indicator of the way in which the paradigm of central banking success is changing. One, one thing, I mean, it's, it's a version of what both Nick and Dan I have said, which is I think we should, uh, we should abandon the principle of neutrality. Uh, it should be a formal statement of, uh, of, of, of intention, which is that we are indeed going to select against um, brown assets and set a clear indication of the the move that's as it were the soft version of the green volker is you know there, there there are going to be winners there are going to be losers there are certain modes of of, of production and, and energy generation that we do not favor that we disfavor and that we are no longer going to support in any form directly or indirectly and push in that direction so that would be the kind of simple statement of principle that's one of the principles that's got to go uh, and trying to sort of shoehorn arguments around that is self-defeating we should just be quite clear about the fact that it's supporting them brown assets directly and directly is inconsistent with other commitments of, of uh, that have been democratically legitimated and that are clearly in the interests of our survival. I think that that is something that, that probably all of us can agree on. I would just like to add one point um, and I don't want to come over across as, as lecturing but um, I very recently read a very good article on, on the use of brown uh, assets in, in uh, this sustainable finance space. And um, so it was pointed out that uh, 
you know, this, the use of brown has a certain racist connotation. And uh, so I myself have come to the conclusion that I will not use this term anymore. And uh, I, I never even thought about, uh, you know. What's the proposed alternative? Well, I mean, there, there actually has been a lot of discussion. I mean, uh, dirty, you know, d dirty right. acids uh, somehow. Dirty sounds great. I'm much, much happier with dirty too. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> Uh, so I think that that's, that, I mean, that, that is just a, a small that's semantic true. change, but I, I think that actually is also an important totally one. Yeah. It also points to, yeah, you know, kind of everything's connected. And, and uh, you know, we, we, we touched a little bit on, on just transition. Uh, so central banking uh, and, and, you know, what's happening in central banks has a lot of implications. Um, and uh, so there's the environmental consequence and, and social consequences. And uh, I, I think, uh, there's this notion of neutrality. Um, I think that probably everyone on the panel uh, here will agree is is very problematic. And, and uh, my take is certainly that uh, central banking has never been neutral. I mean, even simple interest rate policy uh, has distributional consequences. Um, so there are market neutrality, I would say, is, is a fallacy. And, and um, as Nick pointed out, uh, with market uh, with, with climate change as the big, biggest market failure ever, as as Lord Stern put it, um, it is problematic if if uh, central banks and supervisors cling on to this concept. Okay, time is up now. I really would love to continue this exchange and, and also bring in more of the questions because there have been really excellent uh, questions in, in the chat. Um, we won't have time to do that now, but I would like to thank uh, all of the panelists for sharing their time, sharing their insights. I think it has been a very, very good discussion. We will make this available online. Uh, so also people who, who could not sign up because we were actually oversubscribed um, uh, could, could watch it. And I hope it will uh, contribute to a discussion that I think we really need to have on the role of central banks, uh, their relation uh, with the political space um, and, and all these very political questions that, that really are important to address this very urgent problem. So thank you very much. Uh, we will close now and uh, this is to be continued. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Ali. Thank you. Thanks all.